Hi, I'm international publicist Michelle Tennant Nicholson. And with me today, I've got this really special Zoom video. Um, this is in my volunteer services with the Hendersonville Community uh, Co-ops board. I sit on the board. I was elected and I'm in the middle of a three-year term. And recently I went to a diversity training at here in Hendersonville. It was over a few months um, at a uh, at two local churches. And I was really taken with Denye, and I want to introduce Denye Eicher. And Denye, please tell us all about who you are, and um, we're then going to have a really juicy conversation about diversity and inclusion in our cooperatives here in our community. Welcome, Denye. Great, thank you. So I am the equity director at Rainbow Community School in Asheville and Rainbow Institute, which is the adult organization education arm of Rainbow Community Schools. So effectively what I do is train teachers there at the school and in various organizations elsewhere across the air, throughout the area on diversity, equity, and inclusion and how to get there. Well, perfect. Well, <laughs> let's, just, let's just dive in. What is the top thing that when you walk into a grocery store, especially a cooperative that's you know a conscious place with food, what are you looking for? What makes you feel comfortable? What do you think we should include? Well, um, I generally am comfortable almost anywhere, but that's a very different question than, um, than the question of what I find most people want, most organizations want is, ooh, how do we bring about more diversity into our organization? Whether or not it's a business, a nonprofit, a co-op, that is the question that I get most. And, yes. um, yeah, so what, so that's like, <laughs> as a board director, I'm like, I, please tell me how to make it happen. Cause it's my commitment as many, as well as many others. So, you know, we tend to have this idea, particularly in, um, progressive, and I don't mean progressive politically necessarily. I just mean progressive in terms of forward looking and thinking and, and broad thinking about groups of people. But we tend to think that getting diversity is the start of something when in actuality it is not the conclusion but it is the second step because before you can ask sincerely and genuinely for diversity you have to have an inclusive environment because otherwise all you'll do is bring in people who are different and even that language is problematic um, who will either adapt themselves to fit into a group that is not actually inclusive or those folks will leave because you aren't actually inclusive. So the real question I say to organizations looking for diversity that we should be asking is how can we prepare ourselves as an, as an organization to be able to really be diverse? In other words, how can we create an inclusive community? And, and then we go from there. Yeah, and I really was taken with the structures. One of the things that I learned in the series that you taught that I wasn't aware of before is how our laws really, inst like it was set up for some of the issues that we have with inclusion today. And so I see that kind of like it starts with policy, doesn't it, at a cooperative? When, when we're in control of our own business as 4,000 family owners, Mm -hmm. We then get to say what the policy is. What are, what are some of the pitfalls uh, that communities uh, need to watch out for when it comes to creating policy that's inclusive uh, rather than divisive? So I, I would say the, one of the most foundational basic pitfalls that organizations make is to think that when we're talking about inequity, we're talking about how we treat each other, right? So let's take racism, for instance. People assume that that is about, or that is just about how you treat me. And that certainly is a part of it, but in creating inclusive organizations, we have to look at policies that exclude, even if exclusion isn't the intent. So for example? So for example. Um, like let's, let's walk into a grocery store, pretend, and how will we know that the policies there are representative of an inclusive community? Well, there are a couple of things that I look for. One, who is working there? 
and not and, and working in positions that actually have a voice and a seat at the table, right? There's this old saying that um, if you don't have a seat at the, at the table, it's because you're on the menu, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. And so who is, who is a part of making policy decisions? Who is actually at the table where policy decisions are being made, right? Who is at the front office, so to speak? So who is a part of greeting people? Um, I look for anything visually representative of inclusion in the space. So if we are in an area that has a significant, for instance, um, Latinx population, do we have uh, Spanish language signs up? Do we have um, in a grocery store, for instance, or a co-op in this space, any place where we're buying food? Do we have a nice variety of options that represent a variety of ethnicity, right? Things that folks may, things that folks who are coming in may want or be willing to, or be interested in buying. For instance, I am a black woman and I've moved around quite a lot in my, in my life. When I go into a grocery store, I'd like to see, for instance, that they have products that work for my hair, for instance, or for my skin. Doesn't have to be the overwhelming majority, but I'd like to see that there's some representation there. Um, we've talked about, are there signs in different languages? Those are the kinds of things that, um, those are the things that, that I'm looking for just upon first glance. Well, let, so, and then, uh... I know we only have a limited amount of time with you. So the other thing I'm thinking about in terms of who's at the table, right now we're about to do um, voting will be in the fall. And so we're, we're asking for people to run for the board. What is the best way to get diversity in who, because right now we're, we've got a big strategy that calls upon our 4,000 family members, but how can we reach out into the community and make uh, a stronger request of people to help lead us? Um, the, then the questions that I ask are, do you, how much input do you actually want for the, from, the, from various communities? Or how much do you want to impose your ideals on a community? And that's the question that organizations and boards often really have to wrestle with because when we are talking about diversity and inclusion or diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to be willing to sit with the, the, the challenge that perhaps even structurally who we are, we are being exclusive. So that's the first question I ask folks to wrestle with before you start inviting folks in, to really look at ourselves and see, are we, are we really ready or are we just being trendy right now? No, that's good. Or are, we doing, good. We, or, that's or are right. we doing what we think is the right thing to do without doing the work on ourselves, right? Because often what this what this looks like in practice is let's work in bits of a community because my community doesn't have an issue. Clearly, the community in which I am a part of, whatever that looks like, is doing the right thing just because we're even asking for inclusion, equity, and diversity, right? And so that's right. That's where I ask people to start with an assessment of, are we ready? And if we aren't, how do we start to get ready? And I, obviously, I'm a big um, advocate for let's do real equity trainings. Let's look at the history of inequities. So, and I'm going to use example um, without pointing to anyone in particular. So let's look at private schools or a private school. I'm at a private school that is... Um, that it that looks really hard to be inclusive and, and diversity is a big is a really is a, a real interest and a genuine interest for this organization. And and while this particular private school did not start with the purpose and intention of being exclusive, the reality is private schools began as an um, a very explicit effort to segregate white kids and remove them from students of color. That is the history of private schools, even if an individual private school isn't, uh, isn't, didn't start for that reason. So 
we have to look at that history very critically to see how we are operating within the broader context of whatever industry, organization, larger organization that we're part of, and how we can make sure that we aren't replicating exclusivity and in institutions that were meant to be exclusive. Does mm, that make sense? That's super good. Yeah, so thank you so much, Danye. I, I don't think this is gonna be the last time <laughs> that the board asks for your expertise. I have really enjoyed your training. Oh, and I really you. enjoy your leadership here in Hendersonville and, and thank you for spending your time with us and the churches and um, it, it really left a lasting impression on me. And so I, uh, I've been telling everybody about it, you know, and, and then uh, the interactions that I had too, that I, um, I, I, I realized how much I missed Chicago being here in <laughs> Hendersonville and I really missed the richness of diversity. And when I was uh, in Hendersonville at the church group meetings on diversity and how diverse diversity was rep it was represented there, mm -hmm. I was like, "There's hope in this community." You know, there really is. Oh, absolutely. Hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thank you so much. I'm gonna. Um, is there anything finally that you'd like to say? Because I have to wrap up. Yes, there is one final thing because I think when we hear that, right, uh, that all oh, the places where we live and operate every day aren't as diverse as we like them to be. It is heard often as an indictment against the people who make up that community, as if, you know, those people are racist. And what I would say is, you know, let's um, step away from this sort of personal judgment for a moment and look at, as you know, from the series that we did together, let's look at the history of policies that have been put in place that makes areas look the way that they look. Perfect. So we Perfect. think that we think that places and organizations are all white or all one way just because they are. But if we're able to step back and look critically at it, then we, we will find easily a history and connect some dots that shows us why places look the way they look. And only then can we correct that. I love that. How can people reach you if they want to reach you for more training and, and um, leadership and so forth? Um, my e email, well, you can go to Rainbow Community School's website, Rainbow Community School. Um, I have a picture up in administration. Click on that and email me. Okay, so let's just make sure before I let you go that that's easily found. I'm going to share the screen. Look at this. Wonderful. Everybody, so uh, Rainbow Community, Community school. school. Let's see. And there it is. Dot yes. org. Rainbow Community School dot org. And right. there it is right here. So mm -hmm. perfect. Thank you so much, Danielle. I appreciate you. it. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye. Bye bye.